Welcome to worship at First Christian Church in Burleson, Texas. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all consolation. We give thanks this morning that God has made a way for us to continue worshiping together, even when a pandemic keeps us physically apart. We celebrate with those who are joyful. We grieve with those whose hearts are lonely or sad and we hope with those who are anxiously waiting. Let us be silent together for a moment in the presence of God, naming the specific joys, sorrows, and needs of our hearts, trusting that God who hears in silence will answer in love and in wisdom. The Spirit of the Lord is with us. Let us go to God in prayer. Holy God, all-knowing, all-powerful, all-grace, we praise you now. We thank you for each moment of joy in our lives, each opportunity to work with you in healing a broken world. Thank you, Lord, for coming in Jesus, the Word made flesh, that we might know your love. Thank you for the opportunity to share that love with others. Forgive us, God, when we stumble when we sin in what we do and say and in what we fail to do and say, draw us back into your arms and make us whole. God, we have experienced miracles of healing among us recently, and we are grateful, grateful, grateful. But we are also facing unthinkably difficult challenges still, and there's no end in sight. God, our lives have been shaken, yet we know nothing is too hard for you. In Matthew's gospel, we read, I was sick and you visited me. 
But God, people we love have been sick, desperately ill, and we have not been able to visit. People we love have died, and we've been unable to tell them goodbye or even gather in person to share our memories. People we love are grieving right now, and our traditional ways of standing alongside them are denied to us by concerns, concerns that we not further endanger human life. God, this pandemic is cruel in so many ways. People we love, people you love, are sick right now, are lonely, frightened, hurting, jobless. God, our arms ache because we cannot physically enfold each other and taste the salt of one another's tears. Oh God, our help in ages past and our hope for years to come, hold us now and bind us to one another in love. Stand with those that we are not allowed to be near. Hold the hand that is socially distant from us. Wipe the tear, encourage the heart, and whisper love in each waiting ear. God, show your hand and work the miracles that are far beyond our power. Bless those who serve tirelessly and humbly to bring your healing to each child of God. Show us new and creative ways to be a church in this difficult time. Help us remember that absolutely nothing will happen to us that is a surprise to you or that falls beyond your grace. Lord, continue to receive our worship now as we pray in the words our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Incline thine ear to Welcome to our children's moment. The word for today is prepare. Prepare means get ready. Preparing is important as we grow up in life and in faith. I think about going to sleep. Babies don't do much preparing for that, do they? They just fall asleep wherever they are, on someone's shoulder, on the floor. Someone else takes care of almost everything for them. But as we grow in life and in faith, God's plan is for us to prepare. By now, you know when it's time to start getting ready for bed. Now, sometimes we choose to be grumpy about what we know is going to happen, but sulking about bedtime is not helpful. We just have to prepare for it. The first step in preparing is to deal with our mess, right? That may mean picking up Legos so no one steps on them in the dark. It may also mean saying sorry for hurting someone's feelings or doing something wrong so we don't take that to bed with us. The next step in preparing is to be washed clean. 
maybe you take a bath in the morning, so you just need to wash your face and brush your teeth. Or maybe you take a bath at night and wash away all the dirt from working and playing all day. Being washed clean is part of preparing in life and in faith. Now, once we're all clean, we put on our jammies. In our faith life, we say that we put on Jesus Christ. We may take a favorite teddy to bed, to bed with us to remind us that we're not alone. In faith, we have God's Spirit reminding us we are never alone. Maybe it's time for a bedtime story, right? Perhaps you're reading a chapter from a longer book. Or maybe you read a Bible story. Or perhaps both. And when my son was little, we always sang a song. Finally, it's time for bedtime prayers and hugs and kisses. We always sleep better when we remember that God is near, watching over us and those we love. When we prepare, we get ready for sleep and for everything God has planned for us now and always. And give a hug and kiss to someone you love and pray with me. Dear God, teach me to prepare for life today and for life in heaven someday. In Jesus' name, amen. Today's scripture is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verses 35 through 40. Hear now the word of the Lord. Be dressed for action and have your lamps lit. Be like those who are waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet so that they may open the door for him as soon as he knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master finds alert when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will fasten his belt and have them sit down to eat, and he will come and serve them. If he comes during the night or near dawn and finds them so, blessed are those slaves. But know this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready for the son of man is coming at an unexpected hour. Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When I joined the Boy Scout troop that was sponsored by my local church in Corpus Christi, I was required to sub subscribe to three guiding principles of scouting. The Boy Scout Oath, the 12 points of the Boy Scout Law, and the Boy Scout Motto. And each time our troop gathered, we recited from memory these three pillars that framed what it meant to be a Boy Scout. I committed them to memory then, and I can easily recount them now. The Scout Oath states, on my honor, I will do my best to do my duty to God and my country, to obey the Scout law, to help other people at all times, and to keep myself physically strong mentally awake and morally straight. The 12 points of the scout law are a scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. And finally, but by no means least, the Boy Scout motto is be prepared. Be prepared. Not only the Boy Scout motto, but a great song from the Lion King. Be prepared. Good springtime advice for those who, lived in, who live in Tornado Alley, and good summertime advice for those who reside in the southeastern part of the United States. Be prepared. Smart counsel for anyone looking to thrive in our competitive an uncertain world. History has given us lots of sages when it comes to preparation. Alexander Graham Bell said,
before anything else, preparation is the key to success. Now, Ben Franklin was clever. He gave us, and I quote, by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. And Abraham Lincoln said, I will prepare and someday my chance will come. And he illustrated that sentiment like this. He said, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I will spend the first four sharpening the ax. There's a long list of successful venerated figures who have extolled the virtue of preparation. And we can add Jesus to that list. Although Jesus isn't so much a fan of preparation in general, but rather for a very specific event. In the 12th chapter of Luke's gospel, where our scripture reading today is found, we hear a vivid part of Jesus' teachings directed toward his disciples. We can find parallels of this lesson in the 24th chapter of Matthew and in the 13th chapter of Mark. But it's here at the end of today's reading from Luke's gospel that we see Jesus telling his disciples that they must be ready. They must be prepared because the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. This brief sentence lands us in one of the stranger corners of the Jesus story, the part about the future. Luke's version isn't as peculiar as Mark's, which gives us a vision of the sun darkened and the moon extinguished, the stars falling from heaven and the powers of heaven shaken, a vision of the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. However, these words of Jesus certainly take us to a different place, a place quite removed from blessed are the peacemakers. If you had been sitting at, at a classroom desk next to me in seminary, we would have learned together that these scriptural passages are what we call eschatology, the branch of theology that addresses our hope for the future, our future, the church's future, and the future of the world. And it's here that Jesus is telling his disciples to prepare for he will come again. That's eschatology. Jesus wants his disciples and likewise he wants us to grasp a view of the future that is grounded in his words that there is more to come. There is more to come. So we better be ready. Jesus wants us to take to heart his warning that in view of the future, we better be ready. Biblical scholar Luke Timothy Johnson says all of Christian existence stands within an expectation. When we hear these words of Jesus, we expect that God is not finished with the world, that there is more good news, more salvation, more hope, more deliverance, more liberation, more Jesus to come. And we resolve as Jesus' followers to live in a posture of readiness. We resolve to be prepared. For Jesus' first hearers, there were no better illustrations of preparedness than the tending of a lamp and the girding of your loins. In Matthew's gospel, we find where Jesus tells a parable about this. There are 10 bridesmaids awaiting the return of the groom from a wedding to begin the wedding feast. Five of these bridesmaids were wise and thought ahead to bring ample oil for their lamps. The other five were not so wise. Now, these oil lamps were, were so small, one could carry it in their hands, and it looked kind of like a flattened teapot. It needed to be filled with oil in order to burn, and so the first measure of readiness was having ample oil on hand. In the parable, the groom is delayed. The hour gets late, and the ones without ample oil watch their lamps burn out. And as a result, 
are kept out of the feast. Being prepared meant doing some advanced planning. It also meant staying awake and alert. Because even if you have oil, you have to replenish it. And you also have to trim the wick. If you go to sleep with your lamp lit, it won't stay lit for long. Preparation requires constant attention. Now, strange as it may seem on the surface, it also requires proper dress. The phrase at the start of our scripture reading today, which was, be dressed for action, is a rather loose translation of a Greek phrase that literally means, gird your loins. And that expression means to gather up your robes, the robes that men wore in Jesus' day. They were to gather them up about the knees so that they can run without tripping. Preparation means being ready to move. It's always been that way for God's people. The Israelites on the eve of their exodus from Egypt receive instructions for how they're to eat the Passover lamb that commemorates their deliverance. And quoting again from scripture, this is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. God's people have always needed to be ready to move. There's nothing new about that. You see, this is how the church prepares itself in today's world to be ready for the future. Lamps lit, alert, awake, attentive, not dulled by wealth or excess, dressed for action, agile, ready to move, not weighed down by earthly treasures. And so preparation means seeking justice. It means rescuing the oppressed and defending the orphan and for pleading for the widow. Even though we have no idea when the event we're readying ourselves for is coming, and even if we did know, disciples preacher the late Fred Craddock helpfully advises that calculating a timetable of the Lord's return is an inadequate motive for Christian service. It's better to get ready and to stay ready. If the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. Again, from Matthew's gospel, I give you the story of the thief in the night. The thief in the night is the clearest image we have of the New Testament vision of the future. We find it not only in Matthew's gospel, but also in 2 Thessalonians and in 2 Peter and in the book of Revelation. It's an unsettling image. It's a deeply disturbing thing to go through. Think about that. And maybe some of you have actually experienced it at some point in your lifetime to return to your home and find that someone has broken in, that they've rifled through your things, that they've stolen valuables and that they've broken things. What a traumatic disruption. We don't know when the future event is coming, but we know what's coming is disruption. If the homeowner knew, he could have been prepared, but he didn't know, so he wasn't ready. What a shame not to have been ready. Blessed are the ones the master finds alert when he comes, Jesus says in this remarkable par parable. He will fasten his belt and he will have them sit down to eat and he will come and serve them. He will come. But he will come to serve. Later in Luke's gospel, when we find Jesus and the disciples at the table in the upper room, Luke includes a, dis a dispute among the disciples as to which of them is the greatest. And Jesus addresses that dispute by asking, 
who is greater? The one who is at the table or the one who serves? It is not the one who is at the table, yet I am among you as the one who serves. Each time that we come to the Lord's table, we get a taste of the future God is preparing the world for. A future in which the hungry are filled with good things and they are served by those who are full. That's what we want to be ready for. And we can see it and take part in it now. We are living in time between the times. Faith requires us to use the time between the times in preparation. So we keep our lamps lit and we stay dressed for action because we are loving and serving our neighbor, alert to the task at hand, hoping only to be found faithful when the future that we're preparing for arrives. And it surely will. He is coming. Amen. At this time in our worship service, we practice the discipline of Christian stewardship. God has shown us the meaning of generosity in the beautiful diversity of creation, in the overflowing love of Jesus Christ, and in the never-ending gift of the Holy Spirit. God has abundantly blessed each of us and has called us to be a community that blesses others through the sharing of our love, through the sharing of our talents and our material possessions. And so again today, let us rejoice in what we have been given and in what is ours to give as we bring forth our tithes and our offerings. Let us pray. Dear God, Receive the gifts of our hands and hearts offered for your service in the name of the risen Christ. Amen. of his 
thy shadow for my abiding place I ask no other sunshine than the sunshine of his face content to let this world go by to know no gain nor loss my sinful self my only shame my glory all the cross my glory all the cross my sinful self Here we are again this Sunday at the large table to celebrate Holy Communion. And today I'd like to uh, go back with you in some time and share a couple of readings for you. And uh, let's see what we think about these. First is from Alexander Campbell, who published a, a magazine called the Millennium Harbinger. And this was written back in 1830 by an elder in one of the churches about communion and sharing communion together. It goes like this. In memory of his death, this monumental table was instituted. And as the Lord ever lives in heaven, so he ever lives in the hearts of his people. As the first disciples taught by the apostle in person came together into one place to eat the Lord's Supper. And as they selected the first day of the week in honor of his resurrection for this purpose, so we have having the same Lord, the same faith, the same hope with them, have vowed to do as they do. We owe as much to the Lord as they and ought to love, honor, and obey him as much as they. May we pray. Dear Lord, we come together at this table of remembrance and we just say thank you for this tradition that has been carried on throughout the disciples' church and we owe everything that we have to you and, and the gift that Jesus gave us through his resurrection and May we go on each day to follow in your way. Amen. And so now let's go back a few hundred years, go back to the first century and see what was said about the Holy Communion by the Apostle Paul in one of his letters to the Corinthians. Let's see if these words sound familiar to you. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And now I'd like to invite each of you to share in Holy Communion. 
uh, we will do so. I will hear, and you may do it at your uh, place that you're watching this from. And I'll remind you that on, uh, on Sunday from 10 until noon, that out in the parking lot, communion will be shared if you want to drive by and have communion there. So at this time, I'd like to share with you and invite you to partake of the bread in remembrance of Jesus' broken body. And in like manner, I invite you to share with the cup in remembrance of the blood that was sacrificed that we might have life everlasting. May we pray. Dear Lord, we ask your blessing on this bread and this cup and know that each and every day we may spend with you both now and through life eternal. The gift that was given by your son, Jesus our Christ, the sacrifice that he's made, gives us strength and hope and power. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. I now invite you to join with me as we receive a benediction. Go in peace, love and care for one another in the name of Christ, and may the blessing of God the Creator, the peace of Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit abide with you as you travel where He leads, both now and always. Amen. Jesus is all.